I'm here at St. Stephen's Catholic Church in Portland, Oregon. Today is the ninth and last day in our novena for Christmas. So we turn once again to St. Thomas Aquinas in the third part of the Summa. Today, the seventh article, whether Christ should have been born in Bethlehem. We proceed thus to the seventh article, objection one. It would seem that Christ should not have been born in Bethlehem. For it is written, Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3, The law shall come forth from Sion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. But Christ is truly the word of God, therefore he should have come into the world at Jerusalem. Objection number two. Further, it is said in Matthew chapter 2, verse 23, that it is written of Christ that he shall be called a Nazarene, which is taken from Isaiah 11, verse 1, a flower shall rise up out of his root, for Nazareth is interpreted a flower. But a man is named especially from the place of his birth. Therefore, it seems that he should have been born in Nazareth, where also he was conceived and brought up. And objection number three, further, for this, for this was our Lord born into the world, that he might make known the true faith, according to John chapter 18, verse 37. For this was I born, and for this came I into the world, that I should give testimony to the truth. But this would have been easier if he had been born in the city of Rome, which at that time ruled the world. Whence, Paul writing to the Romans, chapter 1, verse 8, says, Your faith is spoken of in the whole world. Therefore, it seems that he should not have been born in Bethlehem. And on the contrary, it is written, Micaeus, verse 2, And thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is, to be the ruler in Israel. Well, I answer that, or St. Thomas Aquinas answers that, Christ willed to be born in Bethlehem for two reasons. First, because he was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, as it is written in Romans chapter 1, verse 3, to whom also was a special promise made concerning Christ, according to 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 1, the man to whom it was appointed concerning the Christ of the God of Jacob said, Therefore he willed to be born at Bethlehem, where David was born, in order that by the very birthplace the promise made to David might be shown to be fulfilled. The evangelist points this out by saying, because he was of, this, of the house and of the family of David. And secondly, because, as Gregory says in Homily 8 on the Gospel, Bethlehem is interpreted the house of bread. It is Christ himself who said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Now let's take a look at the reply to, to objection one. Now we'll look at objection one again. It would seem that Christ should not have been born in Bethlehem, for it is written, The law shall come forth from Sion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. But Christ is truly the word of God. Therefore, he should have come into the world at Jerusalem. All right. Well, what does St. Thomas Aquinas have to say about that? As David was born in Bethlehem, so also did he choose Jerusalem to set up his throne there and to build there the temple of God, so that Jerusalem was at the same time a royal and a priestly city. Now, Christ's priesthood and kingdom were consummated principally in his passion. Therefore, it was becoming that he should choose Bethlehem for his birthplace, and Jerusalem for the scene of his passion. At the same time, too, he put to silence the vain boasting of men who take pride in being born in great cities, where also they desire especially to receive honor. Christ, on the contrary, willed to be born in a mean city and to suffer reproach in a great city. Now, reply to objection two. Objection two, then, is this. Further, it is said that it is written of Christ that he shall be called a Nazarene, which is taken from Isaiah 11, verse 1, a flower shall rise up out of his root, for Nazareth is interpreted a flower. But a man is named especially from the place of his birth, therefore it seems that he should have been born in Nazareth, where also he was conceived and brought up. All right, so the reply to that objection 
excuse me, it's cold out here. Reply to objection two, then. Christ wished to flower by his holy life, not in his carnal birth. Therefore, he wished to be fostered and brought up at Nazareth. But he wished to be born at Bethlehem, away from home, because, as Gregory says, through the human nature which he had taken, he was born, as it were, in a foreign place, foreign not to his power, but to his nature. And again, as Bede says on Luke 2, verse 7, in order that he who found no room at the inn might prepare many mansions for us in his father's house. And reply to objection three. Now let's take a look at objection three once more. Further, for this was our Lord born into the world, that he might make known the true faith, according to John 18, verse 37. For this was I born, and for this came I into the world, that I should give testimony to the truth. But this would have been easier if he had been born in the city of Rome, which at that time ruled the world. Whence Paul, writing to the Romans, chapter 1, verse 8, says, Your faith is spoken of in the whole world. Therefore, it seems, he should not have been born in Bethlehem. All right, well, St. Thomas Aquinas replies to that then. According to a sermon in the Council of Ephesus, if he had chosen the great city of Rome, the change in the world would be ascribed to the influence of her citizens. If he had been the son of the emperor, his benefits would have been attributed to the latter's power. But that we might acknowledge the work of God in the transformation of the whole earth, he chose a poor mother and a birthplace poorer still. But the weak things of the world hath God chosen that he may confound the strong. And that from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. And therefore, in order the more to show his power, he set up the head of his church in Rome itself, which was the head of the world, in sign of his complete victory, in order that from that city the faith might spread throughout the world, according to Isaiah 26, verses 5 and 6. The high city he shall lay low, the feet of the poor, that is, of Christ, shall tread it down, the steps of the needy, that is, of the apostles Peter and Paul. Well, there we have, then, the seventh article, whether Christ should have been born in Bethlehem. Well, we're just about ready for Christmas now, and I wish you a very blessed Christmas Eve. And as we enter into this wonderful octave and season of the Nativity of the Lord. Well, I pray that the intentions you brought into this novena will truly be answered. And maybe they won't be answered in the way that you think they'll be answered. But God will answer your prayer. And He will give you a great gift this Christmas. Now, you have to have your eyes and your ears and your heart open to whatever that might be. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Eternal Father, I offer to thine honor and glory for my eternal salvation and for the salvation of the whole world, the mystery of the birth of our divine Redeemer. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Eternal Father, I offer to thine honor and glory for my eternal salvation and for the salvation of the whole world, the sufferings of the Most Holy Virgin and St. Joseph on that long and weary journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem and the anguish of their hearts at not finding a place of shelter when the Savior of the world was about to be born. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Eternal Father, I offer to thine honor and glory for my eternal salvation and for the salvation of the whole world the sufferings of Jesus in the manger where he was born, the cold he suffered, the tears he shed, and his tender infant cries. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Eternal Father, I offer to thine honor and glory for my eternal salvation and for the salvation of the whole world, the pain which the divine child Jesus felt in his tender body, when he submitted to the rite of circumcision, I offer thee that precious blood which he then first shed for the salvation of all mankind. 
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Eternal Father, I offer to thine honor and glory for my eternal salvation and for the salvation of the whole world, the humility, mortification, patience, charity, and all the virtues of the child Jesus. I thank thee, I love thee, and I bless thee infinitely for this ineffable mystery of the incarnation of the Word of God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, as now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. Let us pray. O God, whose only begotten Son hath appeared in the substance of our flesh, grant we beseech thee that through him whom we acknowledge to have been outwardly like unto us, we may deserve to be renewed in our inward selves, who liveth and reigneth with thee forever and ever. Amen. Well, join me next time for whatever the next novena will be. And don't miss a day of prayer with us. And a very blessed and Merry Christmas to you.